السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم جعلنا ممن إذا أعطي الشكر وإذا وإذا ابتلي الصبر وإذا أذنب استغفر Oh Allah make us from amongst those whom when they are given they are grateful when they are given they are grateful when they are, are tested, they are patient. And when they commit sin, they seek your forgiveness. Uh, for those of you guys on Instagram, is the live freezing? Is it freezing? Do I need to start over? Or can you guys hear and see? Is it? Can you guys hear and see on Instagram? No, you can't. Some people saying it's fine. Okay. All right, great. All right, so alhamdulillah, um, we are at class number eight uh, from our Ramadan series. 
Reflections for the Heart, exploring the hearts that are mentioned in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah. So alhamdulillah, in the last class we talked about the, the blind heart, the heart that is blind. And we talked about how a person could be blind physically, but can see spiritually. And we talked about how someone could be blind spiritually, even though they can see physically. And we mentioned some, some ayat, you know, some ahadith surrounding the blind heart. And then we also talked about the, recom the recompense or the compensation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala usually punishes us with the same thing that we disobey him with. So we mentioned in the ayat in Surah to uh, Taha, Surah to Taha, that's where we left off, Surah to Taha, Surah number 20, ayah 124 through 126. If you have your Quran with you, turn to Surah number 20, ayah 124 to 126. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةٍ ضَنْكَ And whoever turns away from my remembrance, then he will have a hard life. He will have a rough life, a life narrowed down, a tough life. وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى And we will raise him up on the day of judgment blind. We will raise him up on the day of judgment blind. And the servant will turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَّرَتْنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا Oh my Lord, why did you raise me blind when before I could see? Why did you raise me blind when in the life of the world I could see? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, وَكَذَارِكَ أَتَتْكَ آيَاتُنَا فَنَسِيتَهَا وَكَذَارِكَ الْيَوْمْ تُنْسَى And likewise, in the life of the world, when my signs came to you, you turned a blind eye to it. You ignored it. You act like you were blind. And you didn't see my signs. You didn't see my, you know, you didn't see, you didn't recognize my, my warnings. You didn't see that it was haram. You didn't see that you were commanded more be. You turned a blind eye to it. You act like you couldn't see. So today we will not see you. We will not see you by making you blind. So likewise, like you turned a blind eye to my signs, Today you will be forgotten. We will turn a blind eye to you. Al jazau min jins al amal, that the the recompense is usually based upon the very sin that we use to disobey subha, disobey Allah subhanahu wa taala with. So now let's talk about the cure for a blind heart. The cure for a blind heart is number one: sincere repentance. Tawbah to Nasuha. And sincere repentance consists of three things, as many of the scholars mentioned. Sincere repentance consists of number one, stopping the sin. It cannot be sincere repentance if you're continuously doing it. You have to make an intention to stop. You have to stop committing the sin. Al ikla' al ikna' anidham. Al ikla' anidham. Stop committing the sin. Number two, to feel remorse for doing it. The Prophet Sallallahu said, a nedma tawbah. Remorse is the essence of repentance. If you don't feel bad about it, then it's clearly not sincere. If you don't feel bad about it, then it's clearly not sincere. Sincere repentance is when you feel horrible about what you did. Just like a sincere apology, right? You wrong someone, to give a sincere apology means that there is some sense of sympathy. There is a feeling, a sentiment of, you know, that you did something wrong. And if that is not shown at the time that you are apologizing, then in many instances, no one will take your apology, since, uh, you know, seriously. So, the cure for a blind heart, number one, is sincere toba, a toba to nasuha. Tawbah to nasuha sincere repentance, consists of three things. Number one, stop committing the sin. Number two, feel remorse. And number three, make a sincere intention never to go back and do the sin again. Never to go back and do the sin again. And even if the person goes back and does the sin again, then they should complete these three conditions over again. 
Number two, from the ways to cure a blind heart is returning back to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the ayat that we just read in surah number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever turns away from my remembrance, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي Whoever turns away from my remembrance. So turning away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that reminds you of God, whether that is the Qur'an, whether that is the Salat, whether that is the masjid, whether that is righteous friends, anything or anyone that reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or your duty or your obligation to him, you turn away from it. Turning away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore the cure for a blind heart is to turn back to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being around people who remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being in places that remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went out to the marketplace, he went to the souk. Right? He went to the souk. And he saw everybody in the marketplace shopping, buying things or whatever. And Abu Huraira yells out very loud, why are you all here in the marketplace when the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ is being distributed in the masjid? Go to the masjid. Why are you here? They're distributing the, the, the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ in the masjid. So everybody start closing up their shop, running back to the masjid. When they got to the masjid, they barged into the masjid and all they saw was a circle of knowledge. One of the Sahaba was sitting there teaching something from the Qur'an and a group of people were sitting in a circle learning from him. When they ran back to the marketplace, they told Abu Huraira, why did you tell us that the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ was being distributed in the masjid? When we went to the masjid, Abu Huraira said, well, what did you see when you entered the masjid? They said, all we saw was dhikr. we saw the circles of knowledge. Abu Huraira said, well, that was the inheritance of the Prophet ﷺ. Don't you know that prophets do not leave behind inheritance, you know, to be inherited? Don't you know prophets don't leave behind wealth, money to be inherited? They leave behind knowledge. Go get you some. Inna al-anbiya la yuwarrithu dinaran wa la dirham. Inna ma yuwarrithu al-ilm. Faman akhadahu akhadha bihaddan wafirin. That prophets and messengers do not leave behind wealth to be inherited. They leave behind knowledge. So whoever takes a share of that knowledge has taken a great portion of the prophethood that they represented. Absolutely. Can you turn that heat down a little bit? Can you put it on like 70? It's like 60 degrees outside. We don't need the heat up. So the circles of knowledge, uh, the, the other one back there, the, the second one. The circles of knowledge is where we find the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about the dead heart, we'll get into, you know, how the circles of knowledge is where you will find your heart alive. As one of the scholars, he said, Try to find your heart present in three places. Try to find your heart present in three places. In the circles of knowledge, you find that your heart is inspired. You find that your heart is alive. You find that your heart is resonating with the information that is being disseminated. You find that your heart is connecting with the ayat and with the hadith that is being quoted. And when you're reciting the Qur'an, you find that your heart is present. You find that your heart is receptive. You find that your heart is connecting with the ayats that you are reading. وَإِنْ دَ الْخَلْوَ And you try to find your heart at the times when you are alone. It's just you in the room alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You try to find that your heart is present. He said, وَإِنْ لَمْ تَلْتَمِسْ قَلْبَكَ فِي هَذِي ثَلَاثَ مَوَاضِعْ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهَ جَلَ وَعَلَىٰ أَنْ يَمُنَّ عَلَيْكَ بِقَلْبٍ جَدِيدٍ فَلَيْسَ لَكَ قَلْبٍ That if you cannot find your heart in these three places, then just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you with another heart because you don't have one. If you can't find your heart in these three places, then just ask Allah to give you another heart because you don't have one. So the cure for a blind heart is sincere repentance and returning to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This allows one to see straight again and rid himself 
or herself of the indecision and the internal turmoil that is usually associated with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this ayat in the Quran, Surah number 7, ayat 201. If you have your Quran with you, turn to Surah number 7, ayat 201. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا تَذَكَّرُوا فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْصِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that indeed those who fear Allah their norm is to fear Allah. Their norm is to fear Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا Indeed, those who fear Allah, their norm is to be on the dial of, if you turn the dial to obedience, disobedience, and taqwa, fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their dial is always on taqwa. That's their norm. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْا Indeed, those who fear Allah, إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ يَعْنِي الْوَسْوَسَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ If they are ever affected by the whisper of shaitan and lose sight for a moment, تَذَكَّرُوا They are reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْسِرُونَ Then they can see straight again. You see, you see the connection between remembering Allah and being able to see straight. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being able to see straight. Allah mentioned them in, in the ayah, ma'abab, together. That indeed, those who fear Allah, meaning their norm is to fear Allah. But as we all do, sometimes we lose our footing. Sometimes we get you know caught up in the whisper of shaitan in the moment. Shaitan catches us vulnerable in the moment. All of us, no matter how much you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every single one of us is susceptible to the temptations of shaitan. Every single one of us. One of the scholars of the past, he said, Jadaltu or Jahadtu Nafsi Arba'ina Sana. Hatta Astarih Arba'ina Sana. He said, I struggle with myself for 40 years to force myself to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to avoid the, the, the temptation of shaitan. I struggle with myself for 40 years so that I can relax for the rest of my life, for the next 40 years. I struggle with myself for 40 years so that I can relax for 40 years. The reason why many of us don't enjoy Islam is because we are in struggle mode. <laughs> We are in struggle mode all the way until our lives end. There's never a point in time in our lives where we can just relax with our religion and enjoy the fruits of our labor. The labor being mujahada to nafs, struggling against your soul, struggling against your desires, struggling against yourself to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of us never get a chance to enjoy Islam. We're always on struggle mode with our religion. We're always on struggle mode with our faith. Our faith is always one trial away from being kufr. Many, many of us, we're always one trial away from being a disbeliever, from going back to being a disbeliever. SubhanAllah, always. This is why we get married to save ourselves from the hellfire, right? I got to get married because if I don't get married, I fear that I'm going to do something haram. Why can't you work on yourself so that you can use marriage for what you're supposed to use marriage for? You can use marriage as an opportunity to help you get to Jannah, as another stream of spiritual income. You know how a rich person, wealthy person has multiple streams of income, right? They got their main job. They got their side hustle. They got this you know, they, they got a few dollars coming in here, a few dollars coming in here. They say that the average millionaire or the average wealthy person, right? The average person that's wealthy has multiple streams of income, meaning they don't get all of their money from one stream of income. They have multiple streams of income. That's what a smart person would do. You have your main job and then you have your side hustles. Even if they're only bringing in a few dollars a month, 
That few dollars a month that those side hustles are bringing in helps to offset many of your liabilities. You let your assets take care of your liabilities. Very simple math. Very simple math. As a spiritually inclined person, you should have multiple streams of spiritual income. We talked about spiritual income the last time I was here. We talked about Hassanat, right? We talked about Hassanat being our spiritual income, being our spiritual currency, good deeds. So you have to have multiple streams of good deeds, multiple streams where you can bring in good deeds. It can't all be just ibadah. It can't all be just worship. It has to be with charity. You're using your wealth as a, as a stream of spiritual income, right? You're using some of your money. You're pinching off some of your money, and you gotta, right? Using your wealth. You're using your mainstream of, of spiritual income, which is your ibadah, your worship, your salat, your siyam, your fasting, your reading the Quran. That's, that's your mainstream of spiritual income. But then you're using your wealth. You're using your character, right? You're using your good character. Good character will get you into doors that money can't get you into. Good character will get you into doors that money can't get you into. The Prophet ﷺ said, perhaps the person, because of his good character, will reach the level of a person who spends all day fasting and all night praying. And all he did was exercise good character. That's a fact. Good character is a, multi, is a stream of income, spiritual income. You can gain, you can gain hasanat just by way of your character. Your character can open doors for you that... Other things cannot. You understand? And then, of course, marriage. Marriage is a stream of spiritual income because you enter into this union with this person and you begin serving that person. You begin serving your spouse, understanding that everything that you, every energy, piece of energy that you exert within this circle, this realm known as marriage, counts towards your good deeds. So while you have some women who say, oh, cleaning and cooking, that's not wajib. That's not my obligation. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. This is poor thinking. This is poor thinking. This is a person who does not aspire to the higher heights of life. This person does not have any high aspirations. We should aspire highly as Muslims. Evidenced by the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu told us, when you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for paradise, to ask him for Firdaus Al-A'la, the highest place in paradise. The Prophet Sallallahu said, don't ask Allah for paradise. When you ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for, for paradise, ask him for the highest place in paradise. That's high aspirations that we should aspire to higher heights. And not settle for mediocrity. Settle for, you know, and this is why many marriages are just the run-of-the-mill marriages. They're the run-of-the-mill, mediocre, basic marriages. Some of us, we have basic marriages because we only offer what is basic and we only request what is basic. We don't request from our spouses to aspire to higher heights. We don't aspire, we don't, and we don't request, we don't demand from our spouses. No, you got to do better than that. You got to give me better than that. You, we, don't, we don't request that. We don't require that. We settle for mediocrity. We settle for basic. <laughs> we settle for basic. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah, if you ask him for paradise, then ask him for the highest place in paradise. Don't settle for just getting into Jannah. Go for the highest place in paradise. As a matter of fact, there's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, in Allah, yuhibbu ma'ali al-umur wa yakrah safsafaha. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the matters of high importance. The high matters. In Allah, yuhibbu ma'ali al-umur. He loves the high matters. 
And he loves and he hates the lowly matters. The lowly thinking. The lowly aspiring people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates the lowly matters and he loves those that aspire for the higher matters. But these are people who their dial is always on taqwa. However, they slip every now and again. This scholar, he said that I wage war against myself for 40 years so that I could relax for 40 years. Because once you put the work in and you've, you know, you've conditioned yourself to function a certain way, salat just becomes natural. Like your body automatically, well, myself, and I know many of you guys listening, many of you guys here, I don't have to know, I, wallahi, I don't have to look at my phone to see when it's time for salat. My body already tells me that it's time for salat. Because when you condition yourself, your body naturally, it's like when you work out, you go to the gym, right? Brothers, you listening. You go to the gym and you work out, right? And then you stop working out for a while. You stop working out for a while. The first day you get back in the gym, your body automatically knows because you have trained your body. The body naturally knows. The first day back in the gym, your body is already, you know, already conforming because you've already trained it. That's why it's called physical training, <laughs> physical training. Spiritually, your body works the same way. Your heart works the same way. When you are training your body to get up, you understand we submit with the five daily prayers. That's the test of our submission. The five daily prayers is a test of our submission. How well can you submit? And dua is the test of our faith. Salat does not test our faith. Dua tests our faith. Salat, which is a daily regimen of five prayers that are to be made at this particular time. That is to test us to see how well we can submit. And the moment you get the hang of that and you begin to conform to that level of submission, it becomes second nature. You don't even have to think about it. It's time for salat. You go pray. You walk in your house and you know that it's time for salat. Salat came in, you know, five lights ago. You finally you pull up to your driveway. You get in your house. First thing that you do is you go pray. Stop everything. My kids will tell you, first thing we do, go make wudu. We're going to pray. First thing. Because the body is naturally conditioned to submit. It, takes, it says, they say it takes 21 days to establish a habit. 21 days to create a habit. And dua is a test of our faith. Because when you are in those moments when your heart is troubled and your spirituality is being tested, it's in that moment we turn to Allah. We don't make salat. We raise our hands to make dua. It's a test of our faith. We don't run to make salat. We raise our hands in complete humility in front of God. Rabbul Alameen. Absolutely. We don't rush to salat. The first thing we do when we in trouble spiritually, troubled heart, troubled soul, first thing that we do is we say, oh Allah, we turn to Allah in dua. As a matter of fact, the only reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pays attention to us is because of our dua. Allah says in the Quran, Kul ma bikum rabbi lawla dua'ukum. At the last ayat of surah, to, um, surah number 25, the last ayah, turn to the last ayah of Surah, Surah number 25. The last ayah of Surah 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kul ma ya'ba'u bikum rabbi lawla dua'ukum. Say, my Lord would not pay attention to you had it not been for your dua. It's the only reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
listens to us. The only reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns his attention towards us. Can you guys hear on Instagram? I'm sorry, a, a call came in and I have to find a way to mute these calls, man. So I don't know. Call come in and just disrupt everything. Surah number 25. The last ayat. Can you guys hear and see? Is the live good? Now it is. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last ayat in surah number 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, D&D? &D? Okay, I'll do that the next time, inshallah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Say, my Lord would not care about you if it was not for your dua. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to the ayah in surah number 7, ayah 201, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, those who fear Allah, Indeed, those who fear Allah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ إِذَا مَسَّهُمْ طَائِفٌ مِّنَ الشَّيْطَانِ تَذَكَّرُوا Indeed, those who fear Allah, when they, are rem they, when they are touched by a whisper from shaitan, when they are bothered by a whisper from shaitan, when they are taking off you know, their focus, their focus is diverted for a split second by the whispers of shaitan. Tadhakkaru. They remember Allah. فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْسِرُونَ And when they remember Allah, they can see straight again. So blindness of the heart is not consigned to the inability to discern between right and wrong. Good from evil. Halal from haram. But it is also the inability to see what is beneficial for you, even if it was staring you in the face. Something could be beneficial for you, staring you right in your face, but because your heart is blind, you can't even see it. It's staring you right in your face. You can see it physically right in front of you, but you can't see it spiritually. Whether that is a spouse, some of you have overlooked people who was beneficial for you, only to marry two, three times later on. Only to come full circle back around and finally marry the person that you should have married the first time. That's a fact. Stop me when I'm lying. That's a fact. Because you were blind spiritually. You were looking for something physical. Men, we are the greatest proponents of this. Because we are visual creatures. So we're looking for something physically in front of us. I see that's what I wanted. But spiritually, this person right here was the best choice for you. And you overlooked that person because you were spiritually blind, paying attention with your physical eyes. You married this person. You married that person only to, you know, realize, come full circle. And then you finally end up with the person that you should have married the first time, but you were too spiritually blind to see it. That's a fact. Because you were looking with your eyes from the eyes in your head, not the eyes in your heart. And that's the problem. We are physically inclined, not spiritually inclined. So blindness of the heart is not consigned to the inability to discern right from wrong. Good from evil, halal from haram, but it is also the inability to see what is beneficial for you, even if it is staring you in the face. So let me give you an example. Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl, who was given the nickname Fir'aun Hadihil Ummah, the Fir'aun of this Ummah. What Fir'aun was to Bani Israel is what Abu Jahl represented to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Jahl, the pharaoh of this ummah, was not able to see the benefit of Islam even though he knew that the Prophet ﷺ was truthful and trustworthy. Abu Jahl, who knew the Prophet ﷺ was truthful and trustworthy, and although he knew that, 
he was still blind to the benefit that accepting Islam would have done for him. Listen to this conversation that Imam Al-Qurtubi captures for us in his tafsir of a particular ayat. I'm going to give you the ayat after the, I give you this, the conversation. Beautiful conversation. SubhanAllah. But it shows you how blind a person can be spiritually even though they can see physically. This is a conversation between Al-Walid ibn Mughira and Abu Jahl, two chiefs of Quraysh, as they were wa they were walking around the Kaaba one night. فَقَالَ Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl said, وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَصَادِقٌ يعني أن محمد صادق. فَقَالَ وَلِيد ibn Mughira, مَا وَمَا ذَلِكَ وَمَا دَلَّكَ عَلَى ذَلِكَ قال يا أبا عبد الشمس كنا نسميه في في سباه في سباه الصادق الأمين فلما تم عقله وكمل رشده رشده نسميه الكذاب الخائن. They're walking around the Kaaba one night and Abu Jahl says to uh, Al Walid ibn Mughira, he says, I swear by Allah, I swear to God, I know that Muhammad is truthful. I know that Muhammad is truthful. In Nila A'lam and the Husadiq. Wallahi, I swear to God, I know that Muhammad is telling the truth. Al Walid looks at Abu Jahl and says, Oh, wait a minute. Ma, relax. And what caused you to arrive at this understanding? He said, Ya Abad Abdul Shams. He said, oh, servant of the sun. That was his nickname. That was his kunya from Jahiliya. These are idol worshippers. Abdul Shams, servant of the sun. He said, oh, Abdul Shams. He said, when Muhammad was a young man, when Muhammad was a young man in his teenage years, we used to call him what? A sadiq al-amin. The truthful and the trustworthy. That's what we used to call him. Al-amin. That was his nickname before he became the Prophet Wasallam. That's what we used to call him as a teenager. Because he was trustworthy. People used to leave their goods with Muhammad. He would save their goods for them. And when they needed it, he would bring it to them. And that was one of the reasons why he delayed his migration to Medina. The reason why he was one of the last people to migrate from Mecca to Medina was because he had to re return the items to the people, to their owners. What would he have looked like if he had just left and went to Medina taking their valuables with him? That would have been a way for them to discredit his message. Which means that if you have any intentions in your life to be a leader, you got to start from the very beginning being upright. We see that even now in politics. When a person starts to become, you know, getting up in the ranks in, pol in politics, what do they do? They start digging, trying to find some dirt on them. Oh, you know, you see what happened to the, the, the football coach or the back basketball coach? They found a picture of him, right, back in the 60s when a group of mob of white guys was throwing stuff at the four black girls at the, when they started integrating the schools, right? And they, there he is in the picture. They circle his head and it goes viral. Viral. Because you didn't know that you were going to be the head of a basketball team later on in your life, an NBA team later on in your life. But as a teenager, you were involved in some, you know, unsavory, you know, behaviors. And now it's coming back to haunt you. And so the Prophet Sallallahu discharged his duty. Because God forbid I don't return these things to these people. And then later on they use that as a means to discredit my message. Got to be upright. The cowboy's owner. Right, exactly. They found a picture of him. He was amongst the, wob, the, the mob of white boys who were throwing stuff and shouting at the four girls who were, you know, had to be escorted by police into the school because they didn't want, you know, black children, you know, integrating into their school system. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Absolutely. So he says to Mughira, I know that Muhammad is truthful. Mughira says, uh, Al-Walid ibn Mughira says, well, how do you arrive at that, that conclusion? He said, what do we used to call Muhammad before 
um, all of this, you know, him preaching the message of Islam. What did we used to call him before? He said, we used to call him a sadiq al-amin. We used to call him the truthful and the trustworthy one. He said, فَلَمَّا تَمَّ أَقْلُهُ وَكَمُلَ رُشْدُهُ نُسَمِّهِ كَذَّابِ الْخَائِنِ He said, now that his intellect has peaked, meaning he's now a grown man, he's 40. That's the peak of the man's maturity. The peak of a man's maturity is at 40. Now that his intellect has peaked and his wisdom has broadened, are we now going to call him a liar? A betrayer? After we used to call him truthful and trustworthy? What did he do for us to change? Nothing. He said, Wallahi inni la a'lam innahu sadiq. I know that he is telling the truth. How could you see the truth right in front of you, but still blind spiritually to accept it? SubhanAllah. How could you see the truth right in front of you, but still blind spiritually, you can't accept it? So Walid, he asked him, you know, the question of the hour. He said, فَمَا يَمْنَعُكَ أَن تُصَدِّقَهُ وَتُؤْمِنْ بِهِ he says, so then what is stopping you from believing in him and following him? If you know that he's telling the truth, then what's stopping you from believing in him and following him? Listen to his response. He says to uh, Al-Walid, he said, قَالَ أَتَتَحَدَّثُ عَنِّي بَنَاتْ قُرَيْشْ أَنِّي اتَّبَعْتُ يَتِيمْ أَبِي طالب. He said, am I going to follow him? So the women of Quraysh, pay attention. A lot of things men do are for women. He said, am I going to follow him so the women of Quraysh can say that I'm following the, the orphan child, the orphan son of Abu Talib for a few crumbs? Please. Am I going to follow him so that the women of Quraysh can say that I'm following behind the orphan boy of Abu Talib for a few crumbs? Please. He said, Wallat wal Uzza. He said, and we have Allah and Uzza, our idols, our gods. He said, Wallahi ma tabatu Muhammadin Abadin. I will never follow Muhammad. Subhanallah. This guy just said in the same breath, I know that Muhammad is truthful and what he's saying is the truth, but I refuse to follow him. <laughs> So that I won't be condemned or criticized or looked at as less than him because I'm following him. Subhanallah. Blind. Spiritual blindness. As Allah mentions in the ayah that we started this chapter with. For indeed it is not the eyes that go blind. But what? The heart that is in the chest. My goodness man. You can see the truth all day long staring you right in your face. But you don't have the spiritual bandwidth. You don't have the spiritual wherewithal to accept it. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as a result of this conversation... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat from surah number 45, surah to Jathia, ayat 23. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ Pay attention to the ayat, because it correlates almost, I mean, not almost, but of course, Allah revealed the ayat because of this conversation. Allah heard this conversation from above the seven heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ do you not see the one who has taken as his taken his God as his Lord besides Allah? Do you not see the one who has taken his God, uh, his desires as his God besides Allah? And Allah has misled him as a result of that astray from any guidance or any knowledge, any knowledge. وَخَطَمَ عَلَى سَمْعِهِ وَخَطَمَ عَلَى سَمْعِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَجَعَلَ عَلَى بَصْلِهِ خِشَاوَةً And we have put a seal. We have put a seal on his sight and on his heart. And we have placed a covering on his eyes. We have blinded him. Spiritually. Blinded him spiritually. 
Then Allah says at the end of the ayat asking a rhetorical question. And who can guide him after Allah has done it? Take a reminder. Won't you take a reminder? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done this to him, who can guide him? Yeah, it's freezing. There's really nothing I can do about that. You guys can try uh, Facebook. Facebook seems like it's working fine. It's, it's really nothing I can do about that. Unless somebody has a hot spot they would like uh, allow me to use, but it, it just keeps pausing. So for those of you on Instagram that are experiencing, you know, it's going in and out. Um, you can uh, you can go to Facebook, inshallah. You can go to my Facebook page. It's streaming on the Facebook page and it is not. Uh. <clears throat> so, subhanAllah, yeah, there's nothing I can do. I can... I can stop and restart it. I can do that. Um, there's really nothing I can do about that. That's just the the building. It's an older building, so sometimes the the Wi-Fi just goes in and out. So, in contrast, uh, so Abu Jahl he couldn't see the truth, right? He couldn't see the truth out of all of the people that were around him. Out of all of the people that were around the Prophet Wasallam and accepted Islam, he, I mean, just think about it. Abu Jahl is in Mecca. He's seeing all of these people convert to Islam and follow around the Prophet Wasallam. yet he still refuses to do so. You're seeing the truth right in front of you. You're seeing the children of the chiefs of Quraysh convert to Islam. And yet, you still cannot see the truth with your spiritual eyes. SubhanAllah. They say that the eyes are useless when the mind is blind. <laughs> when the heart is blind, the mind is useless. I mean, the, the eyes are useless. It doesn't matter that you can see physically. If you can't see with this, your eyesight is useless. That's how you get to point A to point B. But you are wandering aimlessly through life. And there are many people right now wandering aimlessly through life, have no clue where they're going or how they're going to get there. The only thing they know is work, home, club, party, this event, that event. That's it. They don't know anything else. They know how to get from point A to point B to go see so-and-so, to go show off their clothes to so-and-so, to go be with so-and-so, to go hang out with so-and-so, but they don't know how to use their spiritual vision to navigate their way through the trickery of shaitan, through the deception of shaitan, to make sure that they are right with God in the end. In contrast to, right, in contrast to Abu Jahl, uh, there was another man who was steeped in the darkness of ignorance and disbelief. However, he could clearly see the benefit of Islam when it was presented to him. So think about the example that I gave you of Abu Jahl, who steeped in his ignorance and can see the truth right in front of him, but don't have the spiritual bandwidth to accept it. He can't see with the spiritual lens that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken away from him. But then there's another man who can see clearly the truth of Islam, and his spiritual vision forces him to accept it. Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu Subhanallah. His heart was illuminated with the light of true faith, which manifested in the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the dua of the Prophet sallallahu wasallam for Umar and not for Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl's real name was Amr Ibn Hisham. Amr, which is the, a derivative of the word Umar. You just add the wow at the end of it and you put the sukun on the, on the meme. Amr. Umar, just put the dhamma on the ayn. Umar, Umaru, 
right? It's the same, the same root word, the same letters, right? The Prophet Wasallam one day, seeing that Umar and Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl, man, subhanAllah, this shows you the wisdom of the Prophet Wasallam. because even though Abu Jahl hated him, the Prophet Wasallam still made dua that Allah, you know, guide him to Islam. The Prophet Wasallam not only made dua that Allah guide him to Islam, the Prophet Wasallam made dua that Allah guide him to Islam and make him a benefit to Islam and the Muslims. That Allah honor Islam by guiding him uh, to, uh, to Islam. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. How could you have, like I want you guys to think about this right now. Let's say somebody hates you, hates your guts. You know they hate you. And they do anything in their power, you know, subhanAllah. That takes a lot of digging deep within yourself for you to see good in somebody when they see nothing good about you. Abu Jahl hated the Prophet Wasallam. And in hating the Prophet Wasallam, the Prophet was still able to see past all of the things that made Abu Jahl what he was and miss Islam. Subhanallah. That is the ultimate level of maturity, man. So one day the Prophet Wasallam raises his hands and he says, Allahumma, Aiz al Islam, bi ahabbi umaraini ilik. O Allah, guide to Islam whichever one of the two Umars you deem most beneficial. And although his name was Amr, the root word is Umar, so he said the two Umars. And who he was referring to was Umar bin Khattab and Amr bin Hisham Abu Jahl. He said, whichever two of the, whichever of these two men you deem most beneficial for Islam, then give honor to Islam by guiding him to the religion. Subhanallah. فَكَانَ أَحَبُّهُمَا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَلَ وَعَلَىٰ عُمَارِ بِنْ خُطَّابِ This hadith was mentioned in uh, the jamia of Imam al-Tirmidhi. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to guide Umar bin al-Khattab to Islam. So Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, although blinded physically by his disbelief and a lifestyle of ignorance, Umar's heart was a vessel waiting, was a candle waiting to be lit with the light of divine guidance. And faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for Abu Jahl, although he saw the Prophet sallallahu and he saw the truthfulness of his message, he could not see the divine light that was staring him right in his face, that was in front of him, irrespective of how illuminated it was. No matter how much more popular the Prophet sallallahu became, no matter how many people continued to convert to Islam right in front of him, it still was not enough to spark the light in him to convert to Islam. Whereas Umar, on the other hand, the moment he was properly introduced to Islam, he embraced it immediately. You know who you know who guided Omar to Islam? His sister. Fatima bint Khattab. Umar was on his way to go kill the Prophet. I'm tired of this guy shaming our idols, disrespecting our idols, coming with this new religion, taking many of the children of the chiefs of Quraysh on this, you know, on this suicide mission. Tired of this guy. I'm gonna put it into him right now. He grabs his sword, he grabs his bow and arrow. And he heads out on his way to go kill the Prophet ﷺ. As he's walking around looking, where's Muhammad? Where's Muhammad? Someone said, well, what are you looking for Muhammad for? He said, I'm looking to kill him. I'm tired of him disrespecting our idols. And so, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you think about killing Muhammad, you might want to go talk to your sister and her husband. Because they converted to his religion. So that's what turned Umar in the opposite direction. So Umar started walking back to his sister's house. And it was there, you know, he confronted his sister. And it was there she, he confronted, beat up, her, beat up her husband, confronted her. And then he snatches the mushaf. They're in, they in the house reading the Quran. He snatches the mushaf from the husband. And Fatima, she confronts him and says, you can't touch this book. You're nejish, you're impure. You can't touch this book. Go wash up and then come back and I'll read something from it to you. And she began to read some, some ayats from the Qur'an and he takes his shahada right there. 
sister gave him shahada right there on the spot. This was a guy whose heart was waiting to be lit with the light of Iman. Waiting to be lit with the light of Iman. He could see the truth clearly in front of him. And he, his heart was still receptive to it. All he needed was a proper introduction to Islam. Many non-Muslims right now, all they need is a proper introduction to Islam. That's all they need. A proper introduction. And many of them will convert to Islam. I was one of them. The first time, not the first time, but the first time I heard about Islam, I was 16. I was in juvie, so I wasn't even in the mental state. I had just lost my mother. I was, I was in no mental state to accept Islam. But I was receptive. I was receptive. I never forgot. It lingered until I hit 20 and I was reintroduced properly to Islam. And it was in that moment I accepted Islam. There was no reservation. The only reservation that I had was about being married to the same woman for the rest of my life, to be honest with you. That was my only reservation. I did not see as, as a 20 year old kid that I could be married to the same woman for the rest of my life. And that was my only reservation. That was the only thing that was stopping me from taking my shahada. Because I did not want to be the type of Muslim who converted to Islam and you're still sleeping with women, messing with women. I didn't want to be that person. If I'm going to do this, I need security that, you know, I, I can get my desires under control, get my, my needs met without violating the religion. And alhamdulillah, once, you know, polygyny was kind of explained to me, I always knew that that would be, you know, that would be a, a source of refuge for me. Away from my desires. Not necessarily. Well at that time my desires. As you get older and as you mature. You start to realize that polygyny has very little to do with your desires. Taming your desires. And more about creating another stream of spiritual income. <laughs> You're taking care of a whole nother family. You understand? A family that another man decided I don't want. And you said you know what? I'll take it on. Kudos to any man who can see polygyny from that particular perspective and respect the woman and her children and her family and take on that responsibility as another stream of spiritual income. You think about the Prophet ﷺ, he had nine wives at one time and most of those women had children from previous marriages. Albeit those marriages did not dissolve as a result of divorce, most of them were widows. But in Arab society, many women, as it was Yesterday, as it is today, many women in Arab societies or in, Desi, in the Desi community, if they are divorced, they will never get remarried. In many instances, not from anybody from their tribe, not from anybody from their culture. We African-Americans, because we don't have that type of standard, we don't operate with those particular, particular ethics, we will marry a woman who has been divorced before, but in their culture, they will never get married again. And the Prophet ﷺ was trying to break that stigma that because a woman is a widow or because a woman is, you know, alone with children, that doesn't make her any uh, less valuable than a woman who is a virgin. Evidenced by the fact that every single one of his wives had been married previously with the exception of Aisha. <laughs> Aisha was the only virgin. So if the virtue is in marrying a woman who is a virgin, then the Prophet ﷺ would have married nothing but virgins. The virtue is in marrying someone who comes with a family, comes with a squad. You take on that responsibility as another stream of spiritual income to help you increase your chances of getting to the highest place in paradise that you can possibly get to. That's what it's about. That's what polygyny is about. And if you can manage to see polygyny from that perspective, inshallah ta'ala, I think that we can have many more healthy polygynous relationships in, in our communities. But as long as we're looking at polygyny as an opportunity to satisfy another stream of satisfying my, you know, my desires, then it's always going to be, you know, this, you know, hit and run. This always this, you know, um, discard you when I don't need you anymore because it's not being done for the reasons that polygyny was put here to be, you know, to be done for. It's not what it represents. It's not another way for you to satisfy. Oh, now you got three women you can have sexual intimacy with. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. Because with a woman on, you know, in sexual intimacy, you on borrowed time until her menstrual cycle comes. Then what? You go get another wife? Or until she gets old and she can't do the things that she used to do when she was 20, now that she's 40, 50. 
what do you do? Go get another wife? And do we just keep, you know, just keep this cycle going? Or do we wise up, wisen up, you know, we get smarter. We start to mature spiritually. We start to mature, you know, sexually. And we start to realize that relationships have a more deeper meaning than just satisfying a sexual desire. We're not 16 years old anymore. Jumping from woman to woman, from woman to woman, from woman to woman. What are you, 16, 17 years old? We're adults. We're trying to leave behind a legacy. We're trying to leave behind children that are going to make dua for us because of the experience we gave them when we die. The more children you have, the more opportunities you have for someone amongst those children to make dua for you, to make hajj for you, to make umrah for you, to give sadaqah on your behalf, to slaughter on your behalf. The more children you have, the more families you have, the more your chances increase of somebody from amongst them. You have one family, one wife, miskeen, you got one kid, one, you know, I feel sorry. You got one wife, one, one kid, you know, God forbid you die and, you know, <laughs> you know, she's not pleased with you and the child is disgruntled. You ain't got nobody to do nothing for you. Poor guy, you in the grave, you know, scrambling for any good deeds that somebody would remember to do for you. You die, you got three wives, four wives, you got 20 children, five children from each of them. That was always my vision. I always had a vision of having four wives, five children from each wife, 20 kids. Out of 20, I'm, I'm, I'm at least good for two out of 20 that's going to make dua for me or make hajj for me, make umrah for me, give sadaqah for me. Somebody, right? Somebody. Sheikh Uthameen, rahimahullah ta'ala, he had five sons and one daughter. None of his sons became students of knowledge. But he married his daughter to his top student. She became the student of knowledge. Got one out the deal. <laughs> I got one out of the deal. Walillahi alhamd. And, you know, alhamdulillah. So, you know, we want to increase our chances of, you know, those remembering us and the experience that, the healthy experience that we left them with, that they would, you know, do good for us on our behalf in our absence. Oh Allah, we ask you to grant us foresight, to grant us insight, to grant us vision, to see the errors when we err. Indeed, you are the all-seeing, al-basir. Allahumma munna alayna bil-farasa wal-basira fi khata'ina wa idha akhta'na innaka anta al-basir. I end every chapter with a dua that includes one of the names of Allah that is connected to that particular chapter. So you're learning the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you go along. So that concludes uh, our chapter for um, number three. We move on to chapter number four, and that is the locked heart. The locked heart. Al-Qalb al-Makfool. Al-Qalb al-Makfool. And we don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to just go into the introduction of this heart. The locked heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can you uh, unplug that for me, please? I don't want to talk over the Quran. Just put, just take the plug out right over there with a yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number 47, ayah 24. If you have your Quran with you, turn to surah number 47, ayah 24. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَادُهَا Do they not ponder and reflect on the Quran? Or is there locks on the hearts? Or is there locks on the hearts? The locked heart is the heart that cannot comprehend what was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to a lack of iman, a lack of faith, as mentioned by Imam al-Qurtubi. This includes the commandments of Allah, the prohibitions of Allah, the admonitions of Allah, the metaphors Allah uses, the examples Allah uses, and the general rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in the Qur'an all designed to provide the human being with guidance in all facets of his life, both worldly and those related to the religion. This person who has a locked heart can't understand any of it. You open the Quran, whether the Mus'haf in Arabic, or you open the English translation of the Quran, you see all of the commandments of Allah, all of the prohibitions of Allah, all of the, you know, all of the uh, halal that Allah puts in the Quran, all of the haram, and you don't understand any of it. Your heart is locked. This particular heart, the locked heart, 
does not listen to the Quran when it is recited, nor does it comprehend what is being recited when it is recited. Therefore, it does not ponder on the Quran, nor does it act on the Quran. It is locked so no faith can enter it and no disbelief and hypocrisy can exit it. It is as it is. It's like a fixed mindset, right? You know what a fixed mindset is? This is a person that thinks that everything that they know is all they need to know. They don't need to know anything else. So no new information goes into their head and they don't get a chance to challenge any of the old information that's in their head. They have a fixed mindset. There's a growth mindset and then there's the fixed mindset. Growth mindset is that you are an eternal student. As Imam Ahmed said, We seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. I am a lifelong student. There is never a time where I believe that I know everything. There are students in my class in 5th grade, 6th grade, and 7th grade that I learn things from daily. I am, a, I am a teacher at heart and I am a student by nature. That's a fact. I'm a student by nature, always trying to learn something new. I don't care where I am. I grab inspiration from wherever I find it. I could be listening to a non-Muslim and I could hear him say something and it sparks something in me. And I say, oh, it's an eye in a Quran. Let me, boom. I could be scrolling through Instagram. As a matter of fact, that happened to me this morning. I was scrolling through Instagram and I came across this, this preacher who was preaching, Christian preacher, and he was preaching on his page. I stopped for a moment. I'm like, man, that's kind of deep. I'm like, man, we got something in our religion that talks about that. And I immediately goes to, I go to this ayat that pops into my head and I immediately start typing. Typed up my whole khutbah, the whole khutbah that I'm going to give uh, at the Philadelphia Masjid uh, in two weeks, inshallah, I'm going to save my khutbah. I was going to do it for next week here, but I, I'd rather save it for going to Philly. I, I think people from Philly will enjoy that. But I developed my entire khutbah this morning based upon something, some inspiration that I heard. The Prophet Sallallahu said that knowledge is the lost property of the believer. Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. Wherever you find it, take it. You have more right to it. Al-ilm that wisdom, knowledge is the lost property of the believer. Wherever you find it, you have more right to it. But the locked heart, this heart, it does not ponder or reflect on the Quran, nor does it act on the Quran. It is locked so no faith can enter it and no disbelief or hypocrisy can exit it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sealed the hearts that are of this caliber, evidenced by the generality of the verse. If you look at the verse, he says, Afala Quran. Don't they ponder and reflect on the Quran? Am ala qulubin. He left it general. He didn't say Am ala al He didn't say, or is there locks on their hearts? He said, or is there locks on the hearts? He left it general. So as to not make the reader believe that it was only in reference to the people of Quraysh whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was talking to initially. Many of the scholars, they use this verse as a proof that pondering and reflecting on the Quran and acting upon its guidance and direction is from one of the main acts of worship that is mandatory on every Muslim. It is mandatory upon every Muslim to ponder and reflect on the Quran, to stop. And to think, to digest, to absorb what you just read and to try to make. And one of the things that will help, because I know when you say ponder and reflect on something, some people are like, well, what do you mean ponder and reflect? Like, how do I do that? What, what's the, the method? What's the strategy? In reading, there is something called text to self connections, text to text connections and text to world connections. This is how you teach young readers how to make connections, all right? So the first one, text to self. So when you're reading the Quran, you're reading an ayah from the Quran, you ask yourself, how does this ayah connect to me in my personal life? That's called text to self connection. How do you connect with the text personally? Sometimes you come across an ayah 
And you're like, man, that hit me because there's something that happened to you in your life that that ayat directly resonates with you as a result of. Text to self connection. Then there is text to text connection, which means that you have to be well read. You read an ayah from the Quran. How does that connect with something that you read in a hadith? How does that connect with something that you read in another book? So you can start making the connections. As I said earlier, I was scrolling through Instagram. I came across this Christian preacher page where he was talking about something. And I heard what he said and it connected me to an ayah from the Quran. Text to text connections. When you're reading the Quran, you have to be able to connect what you're reading in the Quran to another text or something else that you've read. Most importantly, a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu and then the third thing is text to world connection. How does this text connect with the world that I live in? Is there anything that's going on in the world, current events right now that connects with this ayat that I'm reading? You guys follow me? What are those three, three connections again? Text to self, text to text, and text to world. If you do that when you read, I don't care what book you read, but we're talking about the Quran. I don't care what book you read. If you utilize that strategy, you can ponder and reflect. Because what you're doing is pondering and reflecting. You follow me? Am I making sense? What you're doing is pondering and reflecting. Yeah. I'll end with this last point. Uh, no, the point is too deep. So I'll wait until tomorrow it's, it's because it's going to require me to go into much more. And we only have a few minutes before Salah, uh, before the event. And I want us to take advantage of the opportunity to make dua in these last moments before we break our fast. The Prophet Wasallam said that the fasting person will have two joys. One is the so in those last moments, right before you break your fast, you make dua. Take advantage of the opportunity to make dua. You guys, I'm I'm really sorry about the you know the pausing of 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 the internet. Inshallah, we'll try to uh, fix that. Inshallah, moving forward. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa taala reward you all. Wa sallallahu ala nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al taslim al kathira. Wa subhanaka rabbi ka rabbi al izzati amma yasifun wa salamu ala al mursalin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. So tomorrow, Inshallah, we'll continue with the locked heart. So just a couple of announcements before I conclude. One is that I will be picking up the books, this book, Reflections for, for the Heart. I will be picking up the book on Saturday, inshallah ta'ala. I will be in New Jersey. I will be at Masjid Nia, Masjid NIA on Roseville Ave in North New Jersey. I will be there not to give a lecture or anything. It's just that I'll be in the area and that's usually where I go to pray when I'm in that area. So I'll be there, inshallah, with the book. So if you want to, you know, jump on the opportunity to grab the book while I'm there, Inshallah ta'ala, I will have the books with me on Saturday. I will have the books with me on Saturday, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I will be at the Philadelphia Masjid in Philadelphia um, Friday the 14th. Friday, April 14th, inshallah, that's two weeks from now. Uh, and I will be giving the khutbah there, inshallah ta'ala. I will also be at the Masjid in Bunton, New Jersey, that same Friday night for a night lecture. I will be doing a night lecture there, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, I will be here next Friday, not this Friday coming, the following Friday. I will be here for Jumu'ah. Uh, also this Friday, uh, two days from now, uh, the traveling Muslimas out of Philadelphia, they will be hosting an iftar here at Masjid Al-Kawthor here in Wilmington, Delaware. You all are welcome to come out and partake in this event, inshallah ta'ala. Come, you know, spend some time, especially for the sisters, inshallah ta'ala. I, I would like to think that the sisters would come out and partake in this, ta'ala. So we will have class all the way up until Maghrib. And then uh, the traveling Muslims, they will uh, be hosting the iftar here uh, at Masjid al Kawthor. All right, so come out, support, inshallah ta'ala. This is an opportunity for us to, you know, spend time with each other, to break fast with one another, inshallah ta'ala, and to, in, you know, and to enjoy the, the space uh, and the positivity that each of us brings to the table. Jazakumallahu khairan.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Wa sallallahu wa ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When am I coming to London? Inshallah, I'll be in London uh, sometime late June. Late June, I'll keep you posted, inshallah. Late June, I'll keep you posted. Jazakumullah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.